Hello, how are you? I'm doing all right. I was going to pace up and down. Yeah, Is that a problem? Sorry, I was going to. Kind of fun with Yeah, I need to walk. That's the first time I've ever stayed in one spot during. During. No hand stand. No hand stand. Yeah. Crab wheels. Started. I'm Meg Calkins with the Department of Landscape Architecture. I, I'm moderating this series of four sessions. Uh, I want to introduce Joe Blaylock, who is a colleague of mine in the Department of Landscape Architecture. He's going to talk about the Black Pearl development of an African American resort community, Atlantic Beach, South Carolina. Um, and uh, he will also probably mention this in his presentation, but he's going to be on sabbatical in the spring visiting this place. Yes. Very lucky. So, thank you very much. Uh, I should also say that if you thought you were coming to a presentation about the Pirates of the Caribbean, this is not it. Uh, so, um, what I wanted to talk about was um, the Black Pearl, which is uh, the nickname for Atlantic Beach, South Carolina. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, its physical form, perhaps how it got there, and uh, maybe some, some um, future for it. Can I do this? I'll do that. All right. Uh, I should also say before we get started that uh, the quality of the images has been downgraded for the, the uh, teleporting of the presentation. So it looks better on my screen than it will on yours. Um, I did want to start off with some limitation. well, talk about my agenda today. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the limitations of the study, an overview of Atlantic Beach and what it is, talk a little bit about context as far as the Gullah and the Geechee people who are um, the folks who founded the city, um, talk about how Gullah and the Gullah lands have been developed or continue to be developed, and talk about some development pressures and Atlantic Beach's future. Um, the first, talk about my limits, this is first stab at an investigation about this place. And so there are still many more questions and I would be more than happy to, uh, to take ideas that you have. Uh, as um, Meg uh, mentioned, this is the precursor to my sabbatical. Uh, I'm going to be gone in a, a year from now, um, not laying on the beach as some would say, but, uh, but investigating uh, this community and this group of folks. Uh, so maybe part of what we're doing now is finding out a little bit more about what I will do uh, more so than what I already have done. So when you think about Myrtle Beach, you probably think about golf, you think about the Strip or the Hard Rock or Broadway at the Beach or sort of these resort kind of ideas of happy, shiny people playing golf and laying on the beach. And I went to the beach last summer uh, for a couple weeks and uh, was staying in Myrtle Beach, actually North Myrtle Beach, just up here. And I uh, looked at the map and I saw this anomaly that this portion of Ocean Boulevard stops, starts, stops, and restarts. And I was there with my mother and I said, Mom, what's the story? What's going on here? And she says, well, that's the black beach. I went, the what? The black beach? Do we really have black beaches? And, uh, and she says, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it was historically a, a black beach. And so, of course, I went immediately and drove over there to see what it is. And it is, in fact, a community that is intentionally divided and intentionally cut off from the rest of the development. Uh, it sits right about here. 
It crosses over Highway 17, which is the major north-south, or it used to be the old uh, north-south route up and down the coast. And uh, you access it, you can only access it from about three streets, or by walking on the beach. So just as a brief sort of give you an idea, it's about a quarter of a mile wide and about six tenths of a mile deep. It, statistically, it is an incorporated town. Um, it was incorporated in 1966. It used to be unincorporated property. Uh, it has a population of 351 people, um, which is much less dense than the neighbor, neighborhoods around it. But this area swells. They said they had 250,000 people on Memorial Day about three years ago. For Memorial Day is their biker week. And so they had a ton of people there. Uh, it does have a very rich history, and uh, I'm not going to be able to go through all of it, but it was basically founded by, uh, the first parcel was uh, sold in 1934 to Dr. A.J. Henderson. And this was a time of segregation, and so the um, white families would come to the beach, and they wanted a place for their, um, uh, it, well, historically, blacks also wanted a place to go. And so um, they founded their own little uh, neighborhood and community. And there's several of these dotted around. Uh, there's only two or three left, um, intentionally still left today. Um, but it was a place for, for blacks to go and be free uh, during segregation. Um, during desegregation in the 70s, 60s, 70s, um, the popularity of Atlantic Beach dropped immensely because people were free to go to other places along the, along the Grand Strand. Uh, it also has a, a rich her heritage in uh, entertainment that when folks like Chubby Checker and, you know, would come to Myrtle Beach, they would oftentimes stay in Atlantic Beach. They would perform in Myrtle Beach, and then they would come back and stay in, in Atlantic Beach and also perform there uh, after hours and after hours clubs. So, it has had uh, that as well. It is separated. Sorry for the photograph. Uh, it is, on one end, it is this red barrier with four stop signs and a dead end sign. So there is definitely a physical barrier between it. On the other side is a hotel resort community, um, nicest place you ever could be with lazy rivers and parking garages. but. It also is, is separated. You can see um, part where it might go through. So here's looking back from that hotel back into the community. So here's, here's that dividing line. And it's basically an alley and a fence. There's a fence. And then this is looking back into Atlantic Beach. And the view from the fence behind the hotel back. So it's also surrounded. It is uh, surrounded on 17. That's the one little strip of commercial that they have. It is surrounded by your typical cheap beachwear kind of places or um, really low rent um, commercial uses. And that. So development has been going on like this, up and down either side of the Grand, uh, either side of Atlantic Beach. And then that's that's it. Also, if you're familiar with it, this is 17, and this is uh, Broadway at the Beach. If you're familiar with Broadway at the Beach, big commercial development. So let me give you just a few imagery, imagery of the of the of the the existing conditions. This is behind that hotel looking at the beach from the top. You can start to see how sparsely populated it is, which is, you think of Myrtle Beach as being a very crowded place, but they have uh, retained some of that early beach life with commercial strip of their own, and a, and a pretty new Broadway uh, boulevard that goes down 
Land is for sale, but not moving. It's still pretty, this is at the south edge. It's still pretty rural looking. And it still has the remnants of its heyday in the 60s that has not been updated. And there's a pretty good tell. Here is, you're on the beach in Atlantic Beach, but it goes up to right below for that parking garage, and then development high rise goes for miles up. The black magic disco. All right, so um, let me talk about the folks who founded it. It was founded by descendants of Gullah or Geechee uh, people, which I'll just refer to as Gullah. Uh, they are direct descendants from uh, Sierra Leone and uh, Liberia and the west coast of Africa from here that came through Charleston with a very specific, um, on a very specific purpose. The slave traders in Charleston would pay a premium for these folks because they knew how to cultivate land and they knew how to work rice in rice fields. And South Carolina was, uh, was starting to work a great deal in rice. Uh, South Carolina main plants were rice, indigo, some tea, and cotton. Okay. So they came to the U.S. and, and settled primarily in this area. So northern Florida to southern North Carolina. And they settled for the most part in the islands. So this is, this is Charleston and Beaufort. Um, they settled mostly in the islands. There were a lot of plantations that happened up along the water edge and up along some of these rivers. The um, settling in the islands was actually very beneficial for them because they were isolated. The white folks didn't like being uh, down next to the water. Uh, it was too hot. They felt uh, malaria and other diseases were down there. And so most of the white uh, landowners moved inland, and which left the, those African Americans at, on the shore and let them stay pretty much intact. They were able to keep a lot of their traditions. They kept a lot of their language and, and foods and uh, were able to, to gel better as a group of folks. And so um, most of the Gullah, actually most of the Gullah stuff um, academically is, is right around Beaufort and St. Helena Island with the Penn Center. There's a, a center that studies the Gullah culture, but it is spread out throughout uh, that, that region. So some of the things that you might know are the sweet, bass, sweet grass baskets. You've probably seen the artwork and some of those things. But some of those traditions can, can be traced directly back to Africa. Uh, the sweet grass basket is uh, from Senegal. And it's, the same, it's used for the same exact purpose, for sifting of rice. So those, those traditions of language and food uh, storytelling, music, folk beliefs, farming, fishing have still continued to this day. And in fact, we get some of our, our words from, uh, from them. Uh, just the, uh, even the, uh, the word tote, to carry something, is a Gullah word. Um, so we also get some of their, some foods from them. They brought a lot of rice dishes, um, gumbo. They have a culture very similar to um, Louisiana. So uh, they settled along that coast and in, worked in those plantations. There were roughly 140 plantations in South Carolina that worked on that waterfront. And so many of them are still around today. Uh, this is an old uh, rice field, um, a historic photo of, of someone working rice. But in landscape architecture, we talk a lot about Middleton Place. And Middleton Place is still a very intact uh, landscape. The, the home has actually been destroyed. There's 
one wing of the home, there was two more portions of the wing of the home that were still there. But uh, it was a rice growing uh, facility. And there still are uh, some of those rice growing facilities around. And so that's actually the second part of my study is to see if I can track those down. The, uh, the, the good news and the bad news is that South Carolina coast has been developing for a long time. You've probably been to, obviously, Myrtle Beach areas, uh, but you can also think of Hilton Head. And Hilton Head is even still divided into plantations, and that dates back to uh, this, this time and this culture. And Hilton Head actually still today has a very strong Gullah culture. Uh, it's one of the, 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 uh, the centers. But what's happening is the, those folks are living on very desirable land. They are right there on the coast, and there is immense pressure to um, sell that land off uh, to make a dollar. So there are, uh, this is one, I'll go through an old field, which is right next to, to Beaufort, where uh, it's telling a little bit about the history of, of this plantation. And then the next slide, they show you all the home sites and the docks and where you can get your deep sea boat in. So last year, my dad called me, and uh, there was a plantation that was on the blocks for a million dollars. I could have bought my own plantation for a million dollars. Um, but that's a lot of what they're doing now. These, these places are trading hands and going for you know, cheap comparatively to what they the, will be able to develop. So um, we'll go back to Myrtle Beach area. Atlantic Beach is up this way. And this is Hunting, Huntington Beach um, State Park. Brook Green Gardens is here. But there's another community called Sandy Island, which is not, it's, it's actually sand um, dunes, but it's not, no longer on the coast. And so it sits here. It's uh, isolated, isolated on purpose, again, um, intentionally to retain their community. It was bought and was going to be developed, and the community fought a bridge to come over to the island. And uh, so today, the only way to get there is by boat. Uh, it has the only school boat in the state. Kids get on the school boat and go. Um, but you can start to see the, the amount of development. All these green are golf courses. Plantations turn very easily into golf courses or subdivisions. So um, I'll let you, uh, I'm not going to go to the, to the video. There's a little video y'all can go to if you want to later. So thinking about what's happened in other places in South Carolina, what's happening in Charleston, what's happening in Beaufort County, and Horry County, where Myrtle Beach is, and um, what's happening in those you know, precious land right there along the coast. What is going to be Atlanta, Atlantic Beach's future? At the moment, um, they are, I think, unorganized, uh, which might play to their advantage. Um, the town was almost bankrupt, was, was almost bankrupt about five years ago. Um, and the landowners, um, they have a, the city has a desire to collect all the different parcels to gather them to bring development to the community. The individual landowners are still fighting it, which may be good in that they will, they will hold on to their, their community for a little bit longer. Uh, part of that may have to do with um, Gullah tradition. Gullah um, typically did not own land like we think of owning land. It was more community-based and it was more family-based. And so it was very traditional that you know, the, the son would build the house in the yard next to the house. And so land down there has transferred uh, from generation to generation for a very long time. Um, so I believe that's, that may happen, some of that is left over from in here as well. 
that uh, they haven't figured out how to how to accumulate enough property to develop. So, um, the the other areas um, that I will study on my on my sabbatical will deal with trying to find some of these old plantations, um, finding um, what of the rice plantations that are still around. Uh, the rice plantations were developed primarily because the, the white families were off the scene. They were developed by that black community, and they knew how to manipulate land to develop and grow rice. So I'm going to see if I can find how many of those are still around and available. Um, with that, I'm going to ask questions. Sorry. A minute early. Yeah. Your, your hypothesis is that the speech community is somehow connected to a more ancient or historical cultural connection to the land. Um, somebody else might say that, I don't know, but looking at it, it kind of looks like a 1920s and 1930s real estate scheme by, mm -hmm. by kind of with it, mm -hmm. perhaps African American um, developers from Harlem that from the history that I've read, the community does trace its roots back to the Gullah um, and to um, the folks right around that region. Uh, they were local folks. They were folks from South Carolina who developed this. It was not, I think they developed it for others to come and enjoy, but they owned it and it was from, from them. The current work that's being done in the community is that they're trying to um, capitalize on some of their black history and so they are trying to strengthen some of those things that probably have been lost. Um, that there probably was a, a very strong sense when it was founded, and then as time went by, um, they did not recognize those connections. So I think there's a, there's a, a concern about that and, and, the, and the revival trying to establish or reestablish some of those connections. Is there a chance that it's just going to be the, the result of, of segregationists flooding the land for Myrtle Beach? Don't know. Um, it was, of course, when it was founded, it was unincorporated land. So the the part just north of there is uh, the Cherry Grove section, which was a plantation. Um, but it's been in my understanding is that that was bought as a chunk and developed as a chunk, and uh, not sure whether it was because they were squeezed into that portion or there was just no other development around it. Yeah. What do the current uh, community members think about this beach? Do they know about it? Do they know that, it's, that it used to be a, 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 um, a segregated beach or whatever? Um, do, does the African American population know that? Does the, uh, the rest of the people living there know that? The folks that live there obviously know it. Those in Atlantic Beach. Those who are in North Myrtle or Myrtle may not. And in fact, part of, I don't know if I can get back to it. Um, part of the problem, too, is that there's very little connection. So the only connection that anybody will ever see is that strip on the highway. And so, quite honestly, when you're on 17, you're booking at 45 miles an hour, trying to get to Broadway at the beach, or trying to get to Olive Garden. You're looking, at else. you're looking at everything else, and you'd actually have to intentionally turn off and drive down to it. Yeah. Can you show that there was development of the city of 
I don't believe there's any buyers. Um, the land that I saw, my understanding was that it was not changing, the, the smaller parcels were not changing hands. And that may be, I don't know why. That may be it's not connected, no one knows about it, it may be a stigma, I don't know. Um, could, be, could be all of those. Um, the, I know the bigger development is not happening because they cannot piece together enough land to make one of those high rises profitable. It's, it's still primarily African Americans who go there, who live there and go there. Uh, statistics, I think easily 85% of the population is African American. Right. 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 Yes. It is not segregated. I mean, it is not segregated on paper. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry. That's all right. Been there. Uh, and the road stopped too. Yes, and, it does. Um, Ocean Grove was a community where you couldn't drive on Sunday. There were no movies or smoke cigarettes or yeah. drink, I suspect. And, uh, there was a mass exodus. You parked your car in Asbury Park on Saturday night yes. so you could drive. Because they closed the gate. Yes, because Ocean Grove was closed. Mm -hmm. It's still a fairly vibrant. Yes, it you is. Know, we don't think of ourselves as that puritanical, but um, it still exists in much the same way that it was. Mm -hmm. They look like typical 30s and 40s beach homes, which were concrete block buildings, most of them. Um, and you can still find some of that building type in some of the older sections of, of beach communities, but you know the newer stuff is wood and elevated and you know. Right. Good question. I don't know. We're going to need to start our okay. five-minute break between sessions. Thanks. Thanks.